He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. And I will count us in. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. I'm Jack Heal, the talking hairdo and the co-host. And we are thrilled today to have Dr. Kevin Poe with us. Um, I asked Phil, who is this guy? And he starts telling me all about it. I went, okay, Phil, you're going to have to take it from here to, to bring Kevin in on the conversation. Yeah, definitely. You know, and uh, I think any of the physicians in my audience will uh, certainly be familiar with Kevin, but the non-physicians uh, may not be as familiar. Uh, but uh, Kevin is a uh, board-certified internal medicine physician, and he has really been one of the leading uh, physician voices on social media, one of the leading physician presences on social media for almost 20 years now. Uh, he has, uh, you know, appeared numerous national media. Uh, he has a daily podcast and a uh, platform, Kevin MD, um, which is really uh, probably one of the largest healthcare podcasts, if not the largest healthcare podcast out there. And Kevin's also written a book, uh, Establishing, Managing, and Protecting Your Online Reputation, a Social Media Guide for Physicians and Medical Practices. So really excited to get into this conversation with Kevin. And uh, first, I'll just let Kevin kind of introduce yourself a little bit more to our audience. Tell us, uh, you know, how you kind of got involved in social media so early, really before there was social media. Well, first off, Jack and Philip, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's an absolute pleasure. And as Philip says, I am an internal medicine physician. I do primary care in Nashua, New Hampshire, which is about 45 minutes north of Boston, where I trained. And I got involved with social media back in 2004. So that was almost 20 years ago. And back then, it certainly wasn't what it is now. At that time, there were a handful of blogs, right? And um, yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll have, we'll, we'll go on Blogger, right? I, I don't know if that even still exists now. It does and actually. It does. I, I just checked that here in the last <laughs> month. I have a a blogger blog that I started <laughs> right after Blogger hit the hit the world, and by God, some of that stuff is still sitting out there. So <laughs> absolutely, I know. So some of the stuff that I wrote back then, I still cringe at. Uh -huh. And um, I think one day, um, I think one of my family members said, you know, you have a lot of opinions about medicine, you should start a blog. And at that time, there weren't many physicians really blogging, right? So I still write a few articles, share my thoughts. And I think there was a drug we call one day, um, Vioxx, which is an anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And then I remember, it got recalled for whatever cardiovascular heart conditions that it would sometimes precipitate. And I remember I wrote something about it and a day or two afterwards, I walked into this exam room with a patient and she said, you know, Dr. Poe, I read your blog post this morning and I was comforted by what you had to say about Vioxx. And at that point, that was kind of that light bulb moment where we can use at that time blogs, you know, I think it was just blogs. There wasn't very many social media, but there were these user generated platforms where we can write an article, share our voice and really impact patients, not just in the exam room, but outside of the exam room as well. And that's kind of where it started. And as both of you know, social media has been really evolving, certainly by the year. There's a, so many new platforms, so many different medias where we can express ourselves. And But that was the really the start of my social media journey. So Phil, why, other than the fact that he's been on social media and as a doctor for a million years, what is it about this guy that, that got you excited about having him on the show? Yeah, you know, what's really gotten me excited and, uh, you know, I've, I've been aware and been following, you know, Kevin and, and the various platforms for a while now is just that sort of outside the box thinking. Because, you know, uh, let's be honest, most traditional physicians still kind of poo-poo social media and the internet in general. And they, they worry about, you know, the patient who came in and Googled their condition and, you know, has, you know, 
whatever information, you know, whatever quality of information. So, you know, for a large part, I would say healthcare still is very uh, hesitant about social media. And I really, uh, you know, was looking forward to getting, getting Kevin's perspective on that. So, you know, I'll start by asking, you know, your colleagues, your, you know, your, let's call it the day job of, of being an internal medicine physician and having a medical practice and interacting with your colleagues. Uh, do you get a lot of pushback about what you do on social media? Not anymore. I think at first, during the first few years, it was a little bit of a novelty. So I was probably maybe one of a few dozen physician bloggers back in the early 2000s. And there were some newspaper pieces. Oh, I was, you know, the blogging doctor, right? So I think at that time it was a novelty. But now we have everyone has that voice on social media. And as you mentioned, a lot of patients, they get their information from online resources. I think the third most popular reason why people go on Google is really for some type of healthcare question that they're not necessarily getting. And for those clinicians who still think patients shouldn't go online to research their health conditions, like that horse has already left the barn. So I think that patients are already going online to get their health information. And as you know, especially during the pandemic, a lot of that health information online isn't necessarily the most reliable, right? It's heavily politicized. It's um, sometimes created by people who don't have the, uh, the, the requisite medical credentials. And, and that's a lot of information that I have to clear up in the exam room. And that takes up a lot of time, energy, and effort. So one of the narratives that I always push in, in the last like 15 to 20 years is that we need more medical professionals, certified medical professionals also to go online, either to create reputable sources of health information for our patients or to dispute and clear up a lot of the misinformation that's out there. And it's been an ongoing journey. So to answer your question, I think that there's certainly much less pushback now. And I think there's actually much more support among the medical profession saying that, hey, we do need to get online. And I think that has been certainly clarified over the last three years of the pandemic where a lot of the misinformation has caused a lot of public harm. Yeah, and I think, you know, you make an excellent point uh, that I certainly share that if we're not uh, out there putting medical information, you know, as medical professionals, someone else is going to be putting the information out there. And uh, so I, I really view it as a, an essential role, uh, an essential part of our role as healthcare practitioners uh, to be, you know, putting the information out where the patients are going to be getting it. Absolutely. And as we all know, people consume information in different ways, right? Some people would go online to say the New York Times or the Washington Post. Some people will read it in email. Some people will get it on their Facebook or Twitter channels. And some people would just get it delivered to their door, right? So I think that we all consume information in different ways. And it's important that, you know, the medical profession, we've been behind on this. I think that we don't realize the value of being where our patients are. So we've been a few years behind and we've allowed other, um, you know, proverbial bad actors to take that online space away from us. So that's one of the things that I always try to um, talk with whenever I give talks to other clinicians, I say, hey, we do have a responsibility to be online and be where the patients are because that little time that we spend in the exam room with patients, whatever, what, 10, 15, in my case, 10, 15 minutes every, every year or so, that's not nearly enough time to give information to the, uh, give patients the information that they need. Talk a little bit about, you know, your, I guess, education, your journey along the way. Obviously, you know, uh, you're drawing upon skills that, you know, we're not taught in medical school, uh, public speaking, writing, uh, you know, uh, speaking, you know, having a podcast, something like that. You know, these are, there are certainly no classes in medical school when we went to medical school. And I doubt even today, there's anything in the medical school curriculum about hosting a podcast or, or, you know, uh, having your own, you know, social media platform. So what kind of education, I guess, have you gotten along the way to be able to uh, do that so well? So it's a lot of trial and error. So there are very few books that you read. And like you said, it's not taught in medical school and residency. But one of the things that um, I've learned in medicine is that if you look 
at trends in other industries and you apply those trends to healthcare and medicine, you'll always be ahead of the curve because medicine's always like three to five years before any other trend. So I looked at say technology and, you know, look at how people are communicating technology and how they're getting online with social media. And, and I thought to myself, Hey, why can I use some of those ideas in healthcare? And all of a sudden, when those ideas are applied to healthcare, all of a sudden you're on the cutting edge when really those ideas are just like commonplace, you know, for, for a long time in other areas. Um, social media has been um, constantly evolving. There's certainly new platforms that comes up almost every year. So again, you look at other industries and see how they're using these new platforms and apply to healthcare. And then you just have to have that growth mindset and use failure as a guide and see what works and what doesn't. And there's a lot of trial and error, you know, in terms of what you can say, what doesn't, what you can't say, what gets politicized. There's a lot of backlash, of course, when it comes to social media. So it's an ongoing trial by fire learning process. But after doing this for you know, almost 20 years now, I think one of my strengths is that I'm able to stick with something for a long time now. So I, I played at that strength and that I'm able to be consistent. I'm able to be persistent despite failures. And um, that's actually served me well to overcome a lot of the obstacles that I've had during those 20 years. Bill, yeah, I have, uh, I don't, I'll I don't want to interrupt, but I, I do have a question that's going to happen eventually here. Yeah, no, we'll get it. Let me do I was just going to follow up on that comment. You know, I think the, uh, the being willing to fail, uh, is a uh, challenge for many physicians. You know, I know certainly, you know, coming from my background as a surgeon, uh, you know, obviously you, you can't uh, fail too many times uh, in that arena. Uh, but when, you know, started doing all this other stuff, uh, you know, you kind of kind of learn sometimes you just put put version one out there and then you iterate and you get better as you go along. Because you look at every other industries and obviously in, in surgery, you know, you can't have version 1.0 and improve on version 2.0 because then you know, the patient would be dead. But if you look at how, um, you know, technology runs, right? You know, I, you know, for instance, let's take a look at Microsoft Window. You know, it just ships at version 1.0, whether it's like done or not. Like, you know, you have all these bugs and you have version 1.1. So you have that mentality in technology where um, you just ship at a certain date, no matter what shape it's in. And then you just fix it in subsequent versions. And I think you're right. A lot of physicians really don't have that mentality. You have that perfectionist mentality. And when it comes to embracing new technologies, that's what really holds us back. You know, we're not afraid to, we're, we're actually, you know, we're, like you said, afraid to fail because that's not the mindset that we're trained in. But sometimes you can't apply that mindset to things like social media, because if you do, if you wait for things to be perfect before you start a podcast, for instance, then you're just never going to start one. So I think it is a different mentality that um, it, it's an entrepreneurship mentality. And that is in stark contrast to what we're um, trained with in medical school and residency. Okay. Do I get to jump in here now? Okay. Remember I'm the resident idiot. I represent the, uh, the, the, the patient who doesn't have a med doesn't have medical training um, and doesn't really speak the language except at a very superficial level. Um, one of the things that that has been blindingly obvious over the last two plus years is that there is has been a uh, an appeal to authority as as a reason to believe somebody. Um, without a concomitant uh, demonstration of actual authority. And I'll, I'll drill down into that. Um, we've gotten an unbelievably uh, complex and in internally contradictory set of instructions about how to deal with this uh, pandemic. Mm. Came from all kinds of different experts in air in air quotes um is there a heuristic that you can use that i can use as a consumer i mean the reality is i am a consumer of of the medical product i'm not a provider i am a consumer we've had so many experts contradict each other experts i mean 
Do you have a heuristic that you use or that you can recommend that I can use to, to know who's just full of crap and, yeah. and who isn't? Yeah. So I think that's, there's uh, been a lot of that. I think that's a, a, a wonderful point in question. I completely agree with you is that there's so many experts out there and they all have great credentials as they know they, and they could contradict each other. And one person can say one thing and the other can say the other. And part of the reason that is, is because of social media itself, right? We're all caught in these echo chambers because for instance, let's say you go on Facebook, on your Facebook feed, who do you tend to hear most from? It tends to be people that you already agree with or people who share your worldview because otherwise you wouldn't like the posts that come on your feed if you don't necessarily agree with them. And I think what happened is that we're all caught in these little echo chambers where we only want to hear what we already agree with. We want already want to hear with what confirms our worldview already. And the other thing about social media is that it gives everyone a platform, no matter what their credentials are. So you could have someone who sees things through a very political light and may have zero medical credentials, but they will be at the same standing on social media as someone with an MD or a PhD. And I think that also contributes to this expert confusion. So, you know, the question then becomes, you know, who can you trust? So like get back to your yeah, original question, question. Who, can, who can you trust? Right. So, you know, I would normally say you would trust the government. You would trust people with expert credentials at, you know, hospitals and, you know, medical schools and universities. Um, but if I say that, you know, there's going to be people who obviously inherently distrust those institutions already. You know, the, the, the biggest rule of thumb that I use when I read something is that people who could admit they're people who admit they're wrong. You know, I think when I read a certain columnist or if I read a certain authority and they could admit sometimes they're wrong or sometimes they agree with a point from the other side of the political equation, that to me would give that person already more trust on my side. People who are not so dogmatic in their worldview, people who can admit, hey, you know, I may have got it wrong in the past, but now because the science changed, this is what I think now. Or, hey, I am a progressive Democrat, but sometimes this point from this Republican, conservative Republican makes a lot of sense. That to me would, it would, would give me a lot of trust in that person, someone who could admit that not only they're wrong or at times someone from a different worldview may agree with them or you may agree with someone from a, of a different political worldview. So um, that to me would be the heuristic that I would use in terms of trusting someone that I read online. In other words, you're talking about humility, someone who's who's got the humility to um, acknowledge their own fallibility and their own um, likelihood of not always getting it right. That's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good one. What is the most uh, challenging set of circumstances that you have faced in your work over the last couple of years? Well, I think it goes back to what I said about people being dogmatic in their thinking. You know, if someone who believes that they shouldn't, you know, that COVID vaccines are harmful or, or they'll downplay the severity of, of COVID or if they take drugs that are proven not to work and if they come into my exam room and they're just dogmatic in their thinking and I would explain what the, what I believe you know, the science is and I will talk to them with the guidelines and they continue on that dogmatic thinking and then something bad harp happens to them because they refuse to believe some of the science that is out there. And that to me is, is, is incredibly frustrating, um, not only for me, but for a lot of um, those of us in the healthcare professional, uh, healthcare community as well, because we've seen a lot of the, worst effects of COVID that people may not necessarily know about. We've seen people on the ventilators in the intensive care units. You know, we've seen people die and the only way that they can connect with their loved ones is through this iPad because they, because of isolation procedures. So we've seen some of these terrible, terrible effects of COVID. And yet sometimes in the exam room, you see some people downplay COVID or 
believe things that simply aren't true. Um, you know, that to me is, is remains the biggest challenge um, over the last few years. People believing things that are not true. People believing the things that are not true. People adhering to a certain worldview that contradicts um, the science and facts that are out there. And sometimes that leads to just terrible consequences. So it's, uh, it, when it comes to my biggest challenge that, that, you know, that I would say is, uh, would be in the last couple of years. Would it be accurate to say then that the information environment that people inhabit is the single biggest, uh, um, obstacle to good medical care and good health? I think it's a huge detriment to good health. Um, it goes to certain worldviews because there are some worldviews out there that are against science and scientists and physicians and um, against authority in general, I think, like you mentioned. And sometimes it is a challenge to care for patients who adopt that worldview and are unwilling to to change or unwilling to consider new information to adapt that worldview. So I would say, yes, when it comes to, and then this leads to that whole question of misinformation online, misinformation on social media. And we, you know, we in healthcare, we do have to spend a lot of time in the exam room, dispelling a lot of the myths that are out there when we could be doing, um, you know, more preventive care, for instance, but instead yeah. we have to spend a lot of time kind of dispelling what this person read on someone's Facebook group, for instance. So I do think that it is a huge detriment to um, a lot of people's care. And I'd like, go ahead, so Bill. I was just going to, I want to explore a slightly different kind of uh, angle of that, I guess, and, and how we as physicians uh, deal with the changing information environment. And, you know, um, like me, you probably heard many times during medical school that, you know, half of what you learn in medical school is going to be proven wrong by the end of your career. We just don't know which half. Uh, and we can point to many examples in medicine where, you know, things that were accepted as absolute dogma, uh, you know, we now would, you know, we now find crazy that anyone ever believed that, you know. Uh, so um, as we kind of go through, you know, this information environment, and uh, this comes up a lot for us, you know, a lot for me uh, in the nutritional space, you know, and, and what we've been told for 40 or 50 years was healthy ways of eating uh, are turning out not to be very healthy ways of eating. Uh, so how do you as a physician uh, kind of approach that problem? Uh, and, and do you think it's been magnified in recent years? Because we do have all the social media and these things get out there. You know, medical journals used to be, you know, they would show up in our office and we would maybe read them in a month or two. And, you know, the information, you know, maybe got to us but patients really didn't have any access to medical journals. And today, you know, the medical journal is on social media and the article is being interpreted, oftentimes misinterpreted <laughs> by the media, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so how, how do you deal with that today as a physician? Yeah, so I think it goes to what Jack said earlier, it has to be dealt with humility. And when, when science changes, and we believe one thing with a certain set of facts and the science evolves and those facts may change, we have to admit that the science has changed. And if we were wrong back then, I think that sometimes we have to admit, hey, we were wrong. And that goes to both sides of the political spectrum. It goes, it goes you know, that applies to conservatives and progressives too, because there has been multiple instances over the past few years where, um, you know, where where both sides weren't necessarily correct at a certain amount of time. And as the situations evolved, um, there's just been kind of a lack of humility, a lack of admitting that, hey, I maybe got it wrong on both sides. And I think that's contributed um, to this lack of trust that one side has for the other. And I think that if we did have a little bit of humility and admit that, hey, you know, what I said back then was wrong and you know, my stance has evolved as the situation in science change. I think that that could only help the problem. Um, but as you know, we don't live in a society where, where that's readily available. We live in a highly politicized 
environment where people don't like to admit that they're wrong. You know, it's sometimes interpreted as a sign of weakness. And until that happens or until that changes, it's difficult to imagine that situation improving. My guess is, um, I, I haven't listened to your podcast, so I'm just guessing here. Help me out. Is your, is your primary audience people like me, consumers of healthcare, or is your primary audience providers of healthcare? I would say that my, it's primarily um, clinicians. Um, I would say about 70 to 80% of my audience, not only on my podcast, but on KevinMD.com, they are physicians and other healthcare professionals like nurses and advanced practice practitioners. But I do have 20 to 30% um, healthcare consumers and other patients. And I think that as one of the things that we may talk about later in terms of why I do that, I do think that there's a little bit of a chasm and a gap between clinicians and patients. And sometimes we do need to share our stories uh, from each side to understand, um, to bridge that gap. Um, you know, a lot of times I don't necessarily know what it's like to undergo some of the tests I prescribe. Like I've never had an MRI before, but I prescribe MRIs, you know, a, a lot. And you know, I've never obviously taken a lot of medication I prescribe. So sometimes I just don't have that patient perspective of what's going on in the healthcare system. So what I try to do is really use my platform that I've built of almost 20 years to really elevate those voices so we can better understand each other. And when I say we, it's like all entities of the healthcare milieu, right? It could be clinicians, nurses, patients, um, administrators, politicians, anyone involved in healthcare, because we do need to share our stories from each of our perspectives. And I think that's the only way to bridge that gap and really um, realize that shared purpose of improving our healthcare system. Well, as a consumer and not a provider, I am in violent agreement with your diagnosis. Yes, there is a massive gap. Um, and I, I think my story and experience is representative, particularly for, for those of us who've been on planet Earth for a while. Um, I have, I, over, over the, the years, I've had so many experiences of physicians giving me advice or recommendations that were later proven to be not just wrong, but harmful. And that has, that, I, I can point to my own personal experience as a reason to have a high level of distrust for what the experts say. I'm old enough to remember when butter and eggs were bad for you. Um, you know, the official word was butter and eggs were bad for you. And I could just, I could list instance after instance over the, the last 40 years um, where accepted medical truth was later proven to be just just wrong and mm -hmm. and worse than wrong but but actually harmful um you know it's and, and and i'm stuck i think i represent i think i'm i'm a good avatar for the typical medical consumer um the longer you've been on planet earth consuming at least uh uh western medical uh services the more likely it is that you've run into to crappy advice. You know, this, this podcast, I'm sorry, I'm kind of ranting a little bit, but this podcast is focused on primarily on uh, metabolic health and, and how it can improve your life. And yet, as Dr. Ovedia has, has been saying for the last year, um, and, the whole idea of metabolic health is it's, a, it's almost a fringe movement in medicine. And yet we have week after week, we have physicians and, and people who've dramatically changed their health outcomes by getting metabolically healthy. So I, there is no question here. I apologize. I just, I, I have a lifetime of frustration with being told to trust the ex experts, trusting the experts, and then feeling like doing so screwed me yeah um so, yeah i'd love to hear of, both of you yeah. address this poor consumer's problem <laughs> yeah no i think that i agree with what you're saying you know i think that traditionally medicine has been very paternalistic in terms of um having that prescriptive relationship between doctor and patient and i do think that's evolved over the last few years um i think that when i see patients 
it's less prescriptive. It's more of a partnership. There are a lot of decisions that have many options. There are a lot of decisions that have varying advantages and disadvantages. And every individual patient has different values, right? So they may have a different tolerance when it comes to side effects or different tolerance when it comes to um, incidental diagnoses from tests and a different risk tolerance, right? And that's laid bare during a pandemic, you know, you're seeing everyone's different risk tolerances and, you know, that kind of influences their worldview when it comes to um, the pandemic. But I think that in general, the doctor patient relationship needs to evolve more into a partnership. Um, I see myself more as a guide in the patient's medical journey. And a lot of the decision-making has to be shared. Um, I do my best to give my pros and cons to any medication diagnostic tests or treatment path to the patient. And uh, unless it's something egregious that I know will harm the patient, uh, I think the final decision always should be the patient's. And as long as it's an informed decision and, um, you know, physicians should have, you know, unless, like I said, a situation where the patient actively harms themselves, uh, I think that the final decision should always be the patient's. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things that uh, gives me, I guess, hope about, uh, you know, the future of healthcare is that I've been seeing that more as well. And as Jack mentioned, you know, we've now had countless physicians on here who, you know, have have that humility you were talking about, have admitted, you know, that we were wrong about, you know, this or that uh, and are looking to move forward, you know, are looking to have that partnership with their patients, um, as you said, and and I I view my role exactly as you said it, you know, I'm an educator, I'm a guide, Uh, I'm not here to tell you what you need to do, or, or, you know, uh, I I even, you know, in my role, you know, when I'm in my heart surgery role, and I'll have a conversation with someone, and it will be glaringly obvious that heart surgery is the best option for them, uh, according to all the science and, you know, the literature and all that. But if the patient doesn't want heart surgery, I'm not here to force them to have heart surgery. I'm here to say, okay, you don't want heart heart surgery. What's the next best thing that we can do for you uh, to help you meet your goals in life? And and, uh, as you said, that's a very important part of it. You know, what the patient uh, wants out of this uh, encounter uh, not necessarily what the physician wants out of the encounter. What's the biggest win you've had over, let's just, let's, let's call it the last couple of years during this, uh, the era of COVID. What's your biggest win as a healthcare, prof- a healthcare practitioner? I would say the biggest win is elevating the voices of those who normally don't get a voice on mainstream media platforms. So one of the other goals that I have on Kevin MD is using that platform to elevate voices, like I said, across the healthcare spectrum. But there are a lot of stories that clinicians face that patients don't necessarily know about, right? We talk about things like clinician burnout. If you look at the statistics, more than 50% of physicians experience symptoms of burnout. And this was only, this was before the pandemic. So yeah. the number is only higher now. And sometimes I walk into the, uh, the exam room and the patients still say they read kevinmd.com or listen to my podcast and they'll come up to me and say, Hey, I really didn't realize that the suicide rate among physicians is so high. And that story about that physician who was a so burnt out because of what he or she saw in the pandemic and had to quit medicine because of that, or realizing some of the tremendous family challenges that a lot of physicians have. You know, I think that in the early yeah. days of the pandemic, you have these two physician families and they both had to work and there were no vaccines or therapeutics available. And they literally had to just redraw their wills because what was going to happen to them because they could have got sick from COVID and died just from going to work and leave the young kids behind. And these are all things that weren't necessarily reported in mainstream media and just having other people just realize to read these stories and realize some of these underreported effects that the, the pandemic would have on the, healthcare community, um, I would say that would be a, that, that is a huge win for the platform in, in terms of just sharing these stories and just letting people know what goes on behind the scenes. 
I, I want to confirm. I went online and checked out KevinMD.com. Um, and I'm not really a science medicine nerd, but I am a well-written or interesting subject nerd. And listen, guys, I'm talking to, to our listeners now. There's a lot of cool stuff on that website. I guarantee you, if you read at all, there's something on KevinMD.com that will be interesting to you. And I can tell that you've been working on this for a long, long time. So kudos in that regard. Um, I'd like right. to. Uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, experience as a physician entrepreneur, uh, mm -hmm. and I think entrepreneurship has largely been, um, you know, kind of driven out or discouraged from medicine. <laughs> you know, we know that the, you know, the number of physicians who are in, you know private practice anymore is, is uh, you know, has dropped dramatically and continues to drop. So how, how do you see entrepreneurship as, as part of, you know, physician life and how do you, uh, I guess, encourage others and how do you balance it in your life? So I think that it's critically important for clinicians to have interests outside of medicine. Now, before I go on, I'm going to say, if your passion is medicine, and if your passion is seeing patients every day, then absolutely double up on that and, and, and continue doing that. But I would say for the majority of physicians, if they do that, if they double down on, on medicine every day and see 20 to 30 patients a day at the expense of their family life and work-life mm -hmm. balance, that is a sure path to burnout. And if physicians leave medicine, if they cut down hours, that really isn't going to do anyone any good. The patient is going to have longer wait times and they're just not going to be able to see a doctor. So I think that it's important to have a passion outside of clinical medicine to balance that. And for a lot of physicians, that is entrepreneurship. It is a proverbial side gig, right? There is a whole entity of physician side gigs. If you go to Facebook, Nisha Mehta, who is a a uh, radiologist in North Carolina. She runs a very popular physician side gigs group. And you see plenty of doctors who have interests and passions outside of clinical medicine. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, why are clinicians burning out, right? And, and mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest reasons is that there's just a lack of empowerment, right? Because medicine isn't what it used to be 20 to 30 years ago. A lot of us, a lot of things that we have to do is dictated to us. It doesn't necessarily improve patient care. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of check boxes that we have to click on. Electronic medical records are very archaic. And there's a lot of things that are forced upon us that don't necessarily help patients. And this is a complete loss of physician empowerment. So having an entrepreneurial spirit allows us to at least take some of the pressure off medicine where we don't have to do medicine because we have to, but because we can enjoy what we're doing. Like we're not forced to practice five days a week. We're not forced to see 30 patients um, in a primary care clinic, but maybe we can cut down and see the patients that we want to see because our income isn't necessarily reliant on what we do every day as a physician. And because there's less pressure, we can actually continue in medicine longer than we would have otherwise. So to answer your question, that's a kind of a circuitous way. I think that there is a role for <laughs> entrepreneurship in medicine, but more broadly speaking, I think there's a role for passions outside of clinical medicine for every physician. Cool. Yes. I, I, lo I love that. I want to follow up um, if it's all right, Phil. Um, I want to follow up with, <laughs> oh, wow, we're down to like four minutes left. You know what? I'm not going to do that. I know you've got a heart out at a, a quarter, a quarter till. So we're not going to get started on the, any more questions. Good start. I have many more questions. It's going to have to wait for the next time. Um, appreciate you being with us, Dr. Poe. I want to port, point our listeners to your website, kevinmd.com. Um, and I guess they can get to virtually everything else from there. Right. I see you've got your podcast is linked. Your book is linked. Uh, real quickly, just give us a, a, a 
do a quick commercial for yourself in terms of the additional things that you provide as a uh, a speaker, a teacher, a coach, those kinds sure. of things. So yes, go to kevinmd.com and then you'll see 20 years worth of stories from healthcare perspectives across the spectrum. I also have a daily podcast there where not only you can um, hear the stories, but you can see the stories by these Kevin MD authors in their own words. And I did interview Philip uh, a couple uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think that if you go to kevinmd.com, you'll see everything that I do, including speaking, um, including coaching, including my podcast, and of course, uh, reading all the perspectives on healthcare. So thank you so much for letting me talk about that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I love it. I love it when a guest provides me enough information to have a, have, you know, get a picture of who they are. I will say without question, this is the most thorough that I've, I've seen so far. So future guests, the bar has been set pretty high. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Phil, anything else you want to say before we let Kevin go? No, I just want to thank Kevin for all that he's doing. You know, I think this is a very uh, important um, aspect of the, uh, you know, of the healthcare system that he's, uh, you know, putting his stamp on and, and kind of showing the way for other physicians so that we can become more empowered. And, uh, you know, we can uh, really take back control of the healthcare system, which is what I think ultimately physicians need to do uh, yes. to benefit our patients. Yes, please, guys, <laughs> take back control, please. <laughs> Thank you so much both for having me on. All right. Well, for Dr. Philip Ovedia and Dr. Kevin Poe, I'm Jack Heal. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. We drop a new episode every Tuesday at midnight Pacific time. Subscribe, all that stuff. You guys know how to do this. You've used podcasts before. And we will talk to you next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.